Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. I'm just going to share with you <coughs> uh, some Bible studies and sermons that I've done over the last four weeks. And uh, so I'm going to just share you these Bible studies and, uh, and sermons and hope you're okay and love to you and to your family. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com. Uh, you can go to my Facebook, you can go to my Twitter, and uh, there you'll see uh, lots of good uh, videos from other Bible teachers and apologists, and uh, some videos of me as well, um, and friends uh, sharing the gospel around the UK. So, I'd like to look at uh, Mark 13. This is a Bible study that we did um, a few weeks ago. And uh, so I'm just going to offer a few pointers from the Bible study. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your blessings. And Father, I just pray as I read this chapter and as we share the word of God, that Father, it will be a blessing to people and uh, an encouragement to people, Father. So we pray that you bless it for your glory. Amen. Amen. So let's go to Mark 13, if you could get your Bible. And as he went out to the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him, privately tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled and Jesus answered them and began to say take heed lest any man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many and when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars be ye not troubled for such things must need be but the end shall not be yet for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes and diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and the synagogues. Ye shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, Take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever you shall be given, you in that hour that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But when you shall see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing there, where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let him that, he, that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither into therein to take anything out of the house. Let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in winter. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Except that the Lord had shortened those days, the flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened those days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, here is, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, even if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars in heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels, send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable 
of the fig tree. When a branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know what summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see that these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But at that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed and watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, even at the midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. <clears throat> I want to make a, a, few, a few pointers before we get into this chapter. First of all, uh, this chapter has to be uh, studied with other chapters. There's a passage in Luke and there's a passage in Matthew that are very similar to this passage. So you need to uh, do your own in-depth study of the other passages as well, which will shine light, which we'll look at in a bit. Second point is that there are three main views of this passage. It's a key passage in eschatology or end times teaching. And so a lot of people will argue about prophecy and some of their arguments will be based on this chapter. And how you view prophetic literature generally will dictate how you interpret these passages, this passage. Why do I say that? I think I say that because we need to be humble and we need to respect other Christians who might take a different understanding of this passage. So there are three different views. There, there is the post-millennial view, which um, is advocated by um, R.C. Sproul. And basically, it basically says, this chapter is all about the Jews of that time. It's all about the fall of the temple and what Christ was saying to the people of that time. It is not about the end times, it's about the Jews of that time. And, and the argument goes from verse 2. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Seest thou these great buildings, where shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. So the argument is that it's about the Jews of that time and the temple. The temple being destroyed, a, a prophecy of the temple being destroyed. And all the things in this chapter, false Christ, nation rising against nation, preaching the gospel, it's all in reference to the people of that time. That's one view. The second view, um, uh, uh, just trying to think who, who would advocate this view. Um, but there's some uh, weighty theologians uh, who take the view that it's a prophecy about the future. That it, it, it's prophesying the fall of the temple, but it has application uh, to the future. Um, I'm trying to think who, who advocates that. Um, so that the, there is this... Um, what can I say? There is... Uh, an application that it's prophesying the fall of the temple, but also that there's a prophecy about the future, that nations shall rise against nation, that they need to preach the gospel uh, to all the world before the Lord comes back, etc. That there's going to be persecution, etc. And uh, great theologians, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, I think he's called Thomas, uh, uh, Reform theologian, a lecturer at Reform Theological Seminary, uh, has written a book on Job and various commentaries for Evangelical Press. Um, 
I think, yeah, I, I think he's called Dr. Thomas. I can't remember, anyhow. Uh, the other view is by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And that is, again, that, there's, that prophecy works on a two-way process that, that uh, you see the near prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem and then the far prophecy of the Lord's coming at the end of time. And so that's another kind of view. It's similar to the other one, but a little bit more nuanced. So those are the three views of the chapter. Um, so let's just go through a little bit of it. And, and I think you need to respect other people who have a different view on that interpretation. Um, you need to respect people and, and arguing over end times uh, prophecies and things like that. You, you need to be respectful because great minds, great theologians of, of every camp, of these three camps, take three different views and yet they love the Lord. So be humble and gracious with fellow Christians who take a different understanding than you. So let's just look at it. Verse 2, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone or another that shall not be thrown down. So he's looking at the temple. And the temple was a, a great building. It was a massive building. The stones were as big as, as jeeps. And... It seemed incredible to the disciples to be told that that was going to be destroyed one day. And it was destroyed in 70 AD. Verse 5, And Jesus answered them, saying, Take heed lest any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. When you shall hear wars and rumours of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. So, he's saying before the temple falls, you're going to see... False messiahs, uh, verse 8, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And he's saying, you know, you're going to see more wars. But take heed to yourself, verse 9, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues shall you be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. And the gospel must be first published among all nations. These things happened in the time of, of the Lord. There were nations upon nations rising up. There were false Christs. The gospel was preached in the known world. But I believe and I agree with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones that prophecy has a two-way meaning sometimes. So the Lord is prophesying about what will happen before the fall of Jerusalem. But these are synonymous with the future coming of the Lord. Which comes out stronger near the end of this chapter where it says that he will come on clouds and the angels will gather his elect. So we must expect near the end times false messiahs, that there are going to be wars, that we're going to be delivered up, that the gospel is going to be preached around the world. Verse 12, But now brother shall be betray brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. It's going to get tough even in families near the end. And then he says, But when you shall see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, now at the time of the fall of Jerusalem, there was a few de desecrations of the temple. There was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but there, there was... Uh, a desire to have Caesar worship at that time, etc. But it's synonymous in the end, in the end times, there's going to be um, the church apostatizing, or somebody coming into the church and turning the church to try and apostatize it. It says, Pray that your flight may not be in winter, so it's again it's to the people of that time. When Jerusalem was sacked, the people of that time, the Christians, there weren't many Christians at Jerusalem because they fled, because they took this prophecy on board. This is prophesying the fall of Jerusalem as well as the future coming of the Messiah. And then he says, And then if any man should say to you, Lo, there is the Christ, no, lo, here he is, believe him not. So false Christ, and there were a lot of false Christ in the time 
of Jesus. And in the time of coming up to the second uh, to the sacking of, of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there was a lot of false Christs, and you can read about them in the book of Josephus. And there's going to be more false Christs even as the end comes soon. Verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now this is where it breaks down for those who say that this passage is only about the Jews at that time. Because here it says that they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power. And, and they argue and say, you know, this is prophetic language talking, about, it's only symbolic, it's not literal. And I find it hard to accept because it says, verse 27, And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth. So in the end time, the Lord is coming and the angels are going to take his elect and bring them together. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know the summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh as the doors. When you see the abomination of desolation in the temple, when you see the church apostatizing, when you see false Christ, when you see more wars, when you see uh, families rising up against believers, be warned, the end is nigh, it is coming. Take ye heed and watch and pray, for you know not when the time is come. For the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and command his porter to watch. We are to watch. We are to watch because the end is near. Things are conspiring in the nations right now, and the end is near. If you come to Mark, Mark Matthew, if we go to Matthew 24, I think it is. Matthew 24 goes on about the destruction of the temple, etc. He says, no man knows the hour or day, etc. And then after Matthew 24, and, and, it, and talking about the exact same language as in Mark 13 about the fall of the temple and the coming of the Lord, we read in the next chapter in Matthew 24, we have Matthew 25, and he says this, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Then they were foolish, took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps, and while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps were gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, let there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And after came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. So anybody who tells you they know the exact day when the Lord is coming, the Jehovah's Witness, if you look at their history, made a number of prophecies about when the Lord was coming. And they were false prophets because they got the wrong dates. Nobody knows the exact day of the Lord coming. Not even the Lord Jesus himself in his day. Now here's a question you might say, well, Jay, um, I, I don't get that, Jay. Uh, how can the Lord not know what the day of the hour? He was God. He was 100% God, he was 100% man. But the, the, the God part only let the man part know what he needed to know. If you remember in Philippians chapter 2 it says, He humbled himself and became of no reputation. Even though he was in the form of God, he humbled himself. And so Jesus humbled himself and in that humiliation, he was not given the man part 
all the knowledge that, that about everything. And that's a mystery. But nobody knows the hour, nobody knows the day when the Lord's coming back, but we are to be watchful. What's happening around the world today is a sign of the end, and we have to be watchful. Now if you go back to Mark chapter 13, there's an important verse. Um, Verse 30, Mark 13, 30. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. So, this is an important thing because a lot of modern scholarship over the last 200 years has basically said Jesus was a failed prophet. He said all these things would happen, that he would come on the clouds, that he would come... Uh, uh, in great mighty power and the elect angels would gather his elect etc and it didn't happen because it says in this generation so how are we to explain this and how are we to answer these modern critics and modern scholars well first of all it says Verse 30, for spirit of I say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Now the word, the Greek word for generation there, when you look at the Lord Jesus when he uses the word generation, it's always it means that generation, the, the 30 or 40 years of, of the people of that time within, you know, the next 30 or 40 years. That generation means the people of that time. All these things were to appear and happen in the time of that generation. So now you're thinking, well, there's a contradiction there because it's prophesying the fall of the temple, but then it's prophesying the Lord's coming on clouds with, with angels gathering the elect. That did not happen in their time. So therefore, there is a contradiction. Well, first of all, the word generation means in that time. So that, that is clear. We can't get out of that. We can't twist that. But here's the point. If you see that prophetic literature works on a double-edged way, that when a prophecy is given sometimes, it can have two meanings. It can have a meaning for the generation, and it can have a meaning for the later generation. So it has a meaning in that generation, the fall of Jerusalem. But it also, remember, for a Jew to see the fall of Jerusalem and the temple was synonymous with the end time. So it had a double meaning. It was symbolic of the end. The, the false Christ in the time of the Jews, it was prophesied. But there was going to be even greater false Christ further on. So these things happened in the generation. When it says he, cut, he comes in the clouds and it will, hap it, will not, it, it will happen in that generation. The kingdom of God came in with the death and resurrection of the Lord in that generation. So in a, in a, in a, in a symbolic way, there is, it, it happened. But in a literal sense, one day, Christ will come back. So you answer the critics by saying that there's a double meaning to prophecy. Sometimes it can mean an event in that time, but have a, a, a future application and and I believe that Dr. Martin Lord Jones is correct and um, if you go and study what he has to say on Mark 13 you'll find that very helpful so we're finished now we we've looked at we've looked at some of the angles some of the issues there this is a very important passage about end times. It's a very important passage. And it's, it's a passage that you need to study in conjunction with Matthew 24. And Matthew 25. And there's a Luke passage which I've not gone into. But I just encourage you to study it, meditate on it in the coming year. Uh, there are some good books around. Banner of Truth published a couple of books that are very helpful. 
And there's a book by Gear, I think it is, called Momentous Event. And I think that's a millennial. Uh, there is um, post millennialism uh, view of the end times. You can go and read Lorraine Botner, which is a book that I'm recently reading. And then for pre millennialism, um, if you go to Dallas Theological Seminary and look up some of the old scholars of the 1950s, like uh, Chaffer or someone like that. You can listen to an old lecture, uh, which, which I think is a little bit, um, I, I don't fully, I, I don't really subscribe to that position because uh, Chapner just focuses that it's all about the Jews, it's all for the Jews and I think it pushes uh, the Jewish aspect far too much. But those are some sources, uh, modern pre-millennialist uh, dispensationalist like Jacob Prash, you can go and listen to him. Uh, but um, post-millennialists like R.C. Sproul um, and uh, amillennialists like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and um, yeah, the, so those, uh, if you go to Reform Theological Seminary and go and listen to various lecturers on end times, you'll see a variety of views but people who believe the Word of God, so... Um, in studying this, I I was struck by that we are in the end times, we are in the last days. And I think that, you know, things are, are going to get more difficult. Um, the gospel is going to be preached, but it, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and we just got to keep focused on Christ, keep focused on proclaiming the gospel, keep focused on what we're called to do. And uh, I would encourage you to study Mark 13. I've just given you a few pointers, a few, a, few, um, a few things to think about really. Just a very, very simple, brief introduction. I haven't got my notes with me on this chapter. Normally I have a stack of notes, like I've got other sermons that hear what I'm going to do. And I've got stacks of notes, but I haven't got any notes for this. I'm doing it off memory. Uh, so I just hope that you get into this chapter, that you study it for yourself and really think about it and apply it to your life. Don't get into all fanciful nonsense. There's a lot of people out there teaching stuff on end times and it's all fanciful nonsense. Like I said, read Lorraine Botner on, on post-millennialism. Get hold of his book. It's a really helpful book. I'm reading it. Go to the Banner of Truth Trust and there's a number of books on end times theology um, that they have and there's different views that they've got but they're really solid books they're really really good go and get one or two of those books and read them um, and then uh, study some of the uh, Lloyd Jones and others on end times theology see what they have to say as well um, have a read of Lewis Burkhoff on end times theology and uh, you can get his book from Banner Truth and also um, uh, Wayne Gruden who's a charismatic Baptist uh, he's done a systematic theology and have a look at what he teaches on end times and uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that because it'll be biblical, it'll be all Bible and he, and he puts out the different views of, of, of end times um, so those are two scholars, uh, Louis, Louis Burkhoff and um, Wayne Grudem that you can go and look at, Systematic Theology. There's also a course on Systematic Theology which will cover end times by uh, Dr. Kelly at Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, that will be a, a real help to you if you want to, um, want to study about end times. Okay. So I'm going to pray. And I just hope that's just a brief introduction to thinking about end times and I uh, hope that I've been able to help you a little bit on, on that chapter. There is a book by R.C. Sproul that goes into, into in depth on the Olivet Discourse. Uh, I think it's the, the Last Days of Jesus. 
it's called and uh, it's a uh, it says how's his view of that passage which I don't agree with but it's a very good book and uh, you, you I think you get a lot out of it it's R.C. Sproul um, the last days of Jesus or something like that or the last I think you can listen to the lectures on uh, Legionnaire Ministries and I think you find that really a help so let's pray I'll go to Sermon Audio there's some good lectures and theologians there or uh, Sermon Index there's some good uh, sermons there that you find a help somebody who would take a different view than me would be uh, John MacArthur um, go and listen to him see what he has to say and um, Jacob Prash Chuck Meisler, they would take all the different views there they're from a different theological perspective but you might like to look at what they have to say as well so I've given you a variety of different theologians and, and thinkers and, and uh, get your teeth into studying that chapter and it will be a real blessing to you alright, let's pray Father, we're mindful that we're living in a world that's fast changing. It's so easy to get bogged down with the issues of the day and bogged down with all our personal challenges and all the gripes and problems that we all have to face in everyday life. But Lord, you've warned us that there is a time when you're coming back. You're coming back for your church, for your people. And are we ready? Are we ready or are we going to be asleep like these virgins were for the wedding? Or have we got oil in our lamp? Have we got the oil of the Holy Spirit in our lives? I pray, Father, for all of us that we would have the oil of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray for my brothers and sisters, especially those who are struggling today, who are serving you but not being encouraged. I pray that you'd encourage them. And I pray that they would know your love and grace in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, all those that hear this video today, that they would just know your love, know your peace and know your encouragement. We think of those churches that are being persecuted, the church in Egypt today that's been bombed. We pray that they might know your love and might know your grace and might know your peace. I pray that you be with them, Lord, in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I've got a, a number of sermons, two sermons, another Bible study to do, a few apologetic notes, so I'm going to just do, finish off. It's a Sunday evening, and I, I, I need to get these things off and done, because uh, tomorrow I'm going out, I'm going to be busy, and... Uh, I won't get chance through the week, so so that's why I'm doing the Bible studies and sermons tonight, and I hope they're a blessing to you. God bless you, and take care. God bless.